question, they've been in the Caribbean since 1985, which I would have mentioned in a little bit. Didn't become a problem until 2005, 2006. Um, they've, been born, they've been in Bonaire since about 2008, 2009, and they got to Tobago in 2012. Right, so we jump quite a few slides ahead. So when I get to that slide, I'm just going to go past that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what we're facing now, next slide. Um, right, so I'm here to talk to you about lionfish. Right? What we're facing is probably one of the newest threats to coral reefs um, in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean itself is already um, badly hit by disease, um, leaching impacts, uh, sedimentation, uh, high tourism impact. Uh, or everything that's negative, that can negatively affect the coral reef, is happening within the Caribbean, right? So much so that, um, well, Caribbean reefs are the worst when compared to all the other reefs within, uh, well, in the world, right? That said, the plus side is they are quite resilient because they are being hammered so frequently and so often they do have a particular resilience. All of that being said, the problem that we're now facing the lionfish, which I'll touch on in a little bit, is symptomatic of that. Because it's been so hammered by all these negative threats, um, always water management, physical damage, etc., it has just made it a lot easier for the lionfish to come in, take advantage of the situation, um, which is why uh, it's having the negative impact that's happening in the reefs. So, what the impact is, it's uh, both an ecological, economic, um, and environmental impact on coral reefs. We have this non native fish from the Indo Pacific. It has no natural predators, no diseases. It potentially produces two million eggs per month. <laughs> potentially, I use the word potentially. It'll, it'll vary between 1.5 and 2, but potentially two million eggs per month. <laughs> Technicality, right? It can potentially reproduce every four days, realistically. Every, um, I think every seven, eight days it usually reproduces. But every four days it can if it wants to, right? Um, no known predators, regardless of what articles that you have read, there are no known predators for lionfish. Even this native habitat, and I'll touch on that in a little bit, right? Um, but regardless of, regardless of what you call this fish, it does the same thing. It eats. It eats a lot and it reproduces quickly, right? Um, and, well, this is here to show you the different names that it's called, but basically it's the same. What we have in the Caribbean here are two species of lionfish. Right? It's actually pronounced terrorist. The first one is Bolotan, so it's a red lionfish. The second one is terrorist Milates. Right? Um, but people call them a whole bunch of different names. Funny enough, we do have one fish belonging to the family of, well, what I should say, the lionfish itself belongs to the family of fish, the scorpion fish. This, um, and we do have a scorpion fish here, which is closely related to this as well. So it too has a, well, similar characteristics, which I'm going to touch on in a little bit, but they're two different things. One is native and it's kept in check. This one is not native and it's not kept in check. Right? Um, but most of the lionfish that we have, both in Trinidad and, well, Trinidad and Tobago, and within the region, they're primarily the, um, the Bolotans. Right? The minority of them are the Malays, but you can't differentiate them visually. Uh, take some genetic analysis to help me Next slide. Before you go, that was all. That, what is the story with that coral reef that fish in the top of the chair there? So I will touch on that in another slide. But I will, I will address it now. I will address it now. Alright? So there's a slide that I have called Physical Characteristics of the Lion. How one differentiates a lion. So, I made an assumption that you guys would be more familiar with lionfish than the average group I would have gone up with. So I did incorporate these questions, but I did put a lot of technical stuff into it as well. So for what he's asking, those feathery, um, those feathery fins he's referring to, those are the pectoral fins. Right, so think of it like pex, pectoral, in terms of fish anatomy. Um, those, that's the least that you can do, so, right? That's, what, that's how you easily recognize a lionfish. It has these characteristic zebra stripes. So it's red and white, black and white, maroon and white, always has zebra stripe pattern. It has these very long feathery pectoral fins. Uh, it has spines, um, spiny dorsal fin, um, spiny um, pelvic um, and uh, anal fin, and dotted uh, caudal, yeah, and dotted caudal fins. Um, the interesting thing though, and the question that I get asked most often is, why is it called a lionfish? Alright, anyone want to pass the guess as to why it's called a lionfish? 
Right, so most people think it's because when it when it has all the fins displayed, and that's just for it to look big and to corral the fish. Right? It's not an aggressive um, stance, it's just for it to corral the fish and for it to look a lot bigger and menacing. Um, most people think it's because of that. Um, recently, well, not really recently, um, what we believe actually is a, a bit close to the truth, though that is correct as well. Um, I guess it was someone's idea for you as to, to give it a name to reflect the, the menacing potential that it has in terms of the impact it has on the ecosystem. It's a voracious predator. It, it's gluttonous. It eats everything. It's big enough to fit in its mouth, it will eat it and will eat a lot of it. All right? So why I ask that question, the interesting thing about it is the word um, terrorist um, is from the Latin meaning other. So its real name yeah, it's like a hub of fish because when you see it on the reef, it's literally just sitting and hovering over the, uh, the seafloor. Alright, and well, the, the scientific name, um, I think Malays, it's soldier, so like hovering soldier, and I can't remember what the other one stands for. I'm going to say five or something. But uh, yeah, so the actual name would be closer to like a hovering fish, but we call it lion fish because of the menacing appearance and because of its appetite. Right. Um, Next slide. Right. So I mentioned it's a voracious predator. It eats everything, right? And that is that's probably the main problem that we're facing in the Caribbean, and that's linked to every other problem that is that is causing, right? From commercially important fish um, like groupers and snappers, juvenile groupers and snappers, uh, including shellfish like lobsters and crabs, they will consume all of that, right? From fish that anglers like to get, um, whether it's um, or oh, anglers or even deep sea, um, deep sea, uh, deep sea fishing, um, like juvenile billfish, juvenile mahi mahi, it will consume all of that. Uh, even in terms of ecologically important fish, like like rats and gobies, these are cleaner fish. They get rid of a lot of the, the parasites that are on some of the larger fish in terms of reducing disease. Um, a favorite of them, especially when they find the diets of a lot of them here, a lot of rats and a lot of um, parafish. All right. Um, these are important herbivores, grazers on our coral reef ecosystem. While that's important, is there's a delicate balance of coral reefs between corals themselves and algae. There's a competition for light and it's a competition for photosynthesis. So if if algae are uh, winning the competition, then a reef gets overwhelmed by algae, and then you have a, a dead or dying reef. All right. Um, corals and other organisms on the reef they have ways of you know, fighting against uh, the algae, uh, various stings, etc. Because the coral itself is like a jellyfish, so it does have sting themselves. Um, so they have different ways of combating that. But if that balance is upset, um, like what would happen if you get rid of a significant amount of your grazers, for example, or some of your cleaners, you will have a shift in that balance. So this is just to give you an idea of some of the fish that we've been finding in the stomach. This graphic right here, um, this is a single fish. Right? And all of that is what was found in the stomach. Right? Actually, um, the thing about it is the lionfish itself, its stomach can stretch 50 times its size. Right? So it can consume a fish up to two thirds its size and it can stretch its stomach to 30 times its stomach's empty size. Right? The record so far has been some in the vicinity of 60 or 61 fish in its stomach. Right? The most I've seen so far has been about 5 or 6. So, but most of all, like, which are fairly small, of course, the larger gets the more needs, right? So remember I said, voracious predator, very prolific, so potentially 2 million eggs, even if one zero 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 one of those survives, and that's from one breeding event, right? Imagine what happens with the others and how many people, um, how many other fish you have that can potentially impact them. Next slide. Right, so usually the next question that people ask is, <laughs> <laughs> where did it come from? With the touchstone. <laughs> right, so um, I started by saying that they're non um, the non native, right? They're alien invasive species. Alien meaning the non native from here, invasive meaning they are spreading quickly, they're spreading everywhere, right? Uh, it is native uh, habitat, which is within the, um, the Indo Pacific, uh, Pacific, uh, not only Mediterranean. So in the Mediterranean, you would have found one species of lionfish there, which would have been terrorist millets. 
Now the Ebolatans is now invading that area. So while it's a non-native um, inhabitant, because they had lionfish there before, it's not so much of a big problem, but still the introduction of a new species is an issue in itself. So it's originally from this part of the world. Right? How we got over to our side, and it's, in its part of the world, it's perfectly fine. It's not the top predator. It is a predator, but it's not the top predator. Right? It's kept in check due to cannibalism, um, well, insectal predation, people consume it over there, um, disease, parasites, all this kind of stuff control it over there. We don't have that kind of stuff here. So that's the problem. So what happened was someone decided to bring it across. Right? So the very first recorded incident of the lionfish in the Caribbean slash Atlantic, or the Atlantic, was somewhere around October 1985. Right? So for a good while, for, since 1985 to about the late 90s, right? lionfish have been off the eastern coast of the, um, of the states. They know it's been there, it's been there for a while. Um, those are usually as a result of um, of people with lionfish in the aquarium, in the aquarium, and just throwing it out to sea. Because it is a very attractive fish, that's why it comes across. It's exported as part of the aquarium trade from this side of the world to people who want it in their aquarium. Right? And then it gets too big and manageable, so they toss it into the sea. Right? So it's actually stayed within the eastern um, seaboard within the States for a while. Right? Then somewhere around, next slide, then somewhere around the 2000, 2005, it jumped across to the Bahamas, which is that little dot over there. Um, and then it just went through a rapid population explosion. That's the second problem with, um, with alien invasives. No, okay. That's the second problem. I just think it is wrong. That's the second problem with alien invasives. Right? They go through these cycles of population explosions and then these lulls. Right? So the like which right now is still going through its explosion phase, it's a recent addition to our ecosystem, it has not gone through the explosion yet for us. So we're still tracking what's, we're still following what's happening, we'll show you some data now. But anyway, it got to the Bahamas around 2005-2006, it went through this rapid expansion, it just started reproducing ridiculously. And what happens is when it reproduces, it produces these gelatinous masses, so the eggs come out in these masses, and I have a graph that will describe this piece, right? Um, it's a mucus filled jelly like mass that floats uh, over the ocean, but it floats in the surface, ocean currents and the wind, you know, spread it throughout the region. So the adult fish isn't swimming from place to place. It isn't swimming from island to island. It's actually the ocean currents that's spreading the eggs and the larvae around. Then when they mature a little bit, they settle onto the substrates, and then that's where they stay, generally. And that's what's been happening. So since then, it's been rapidly spreading throughout the region. Every country has had it, right? We are the very last addition to the Caribbean. In 2012, we got our very first confirmed lionfish, right? It happened in Castara in 2012. Trinidad had its very first confirmed lionfish in December 2013, right? The very first for Trinidad. Um, and the very first for Tobago was in 2012. Not that they, they were not here before, it's just how these records work. You need to have an actual specimen um, for them to confirm that it is here. And since then, you know, we've been seeing a lot more of them. Right? So we are the, at the southern limit of it. Um, the red hat represents where they think that it might be able to expand to. It is limited by temperature though, so when, you get to, when the water gets to about 10 degrees Celsius, that seems to be its lower limit. Right, so you can tolerate 12, we can tolerate 11. When it gets about 10, right, it just does not seem to be able to tolerate that. So it may not get past Brazil. Um, I've heard some reports that it may be in Brazil, but I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen any reporting or anything to confirm that. But it may be Brazilian rays. I'm not sure as yet. Um, but that's as far as we expect it to get in this phase of this invasion. Right, next slide. Uh, Justin, before you move uh, on, where was the first Trinidad site? The very first Trinidad site was in Castile. But to Pope in Trinidad. Oh, sorry, but that's the big one. In Trinidad was in. Um, Shakshitari. Okay. Yeah, so we've, we've had in Trinidad. Well, there's a graphic that's going to show you. <laughs> we've, there was a, there's been in Shakshitari, there's been in Macri. The very first one in Macri was actually caught in Carnival Monday. Um, we've had in Lunas, Shogo. Um, 
couple of people have reported in some other areas, but I haven't gotten a chance to check out those ones as yet. People tend to confuse it with um, some other fish, which I have a graphic on, so it shouldn't really confuse it with as well. So um, I thought there's still a question coming in. Oh, okay. Right, so, um, so I mentioned before, it's reproduction, right? So it's a voracious predator, right? So it touches the food, it eats everything and it eats a lot of it, right? It reproduces efficiently, right? Potentially every four to five days, realistically, probably every seven to eight days. Um, if, it's, if it's starved, like if, uh, if resources are low, it'll probably reproduce once a month if reproduce it. If, if resources are uh, high, it'll reproduce every four or five days. Um, every event, you're looking at about 50,000 eggs. Um, sexual maturity within one to two years. To put that in context, I mentioned that it was a predator, right? It's a carnivore. We have carnivores. We have groupers. Groupers are local carnivores. A grouper takes six or seven years to reach sexual maturity. Right? A lionfish, which is its competitor, takes um, one to two years, most times around one year, to reach sexual maturity. Right? Just to put that in context. Right? Uh, the, larger them, uh, the eggs themselves have another degree of protection. So while one would assume these, these, this sack of eggs and um, floating in the water are probably picked on by other fish, the mucus in the, um, in the, uh, that surround the eggs it actually has these acids in it, this, this repellent, right, which is deterrent to other fish stamping on it. Right? So it's only until they leave the eggs and then they set the loo, other fish can um, wrap them up. Uh, but the eggs themselves seem to be pretty safe. Next slide. Right. So I touched on this before, but in its native environment, you find the lionfish at about 50 meters. Um, yeah, you can find it up to about 50 meters. Depth, and you only find it, or you generally find it in a reef type habitat, so in a hard bottom type habitat. Alright? So it's not very deep, and it's generally contained within the coral reefs. Right? That's where its food is, that's where it's going to stay. Here, it is a brand new environment. It has all this food, all this space, no predation, no parasites, and happy. Alright? You can find it down to 300 meters in depth. In every marine habitat you can think of seagrass, mangrove, Sandy lagoon, coral reef, rocky hot water, you'll find it in every one of those environments. Right? So it's become quite a generalist and it's feeding, it doesn't feed on one thing, it feeds on everything. Right? So that's the third part of the problem. So it's become a generalist, it's reproducing very well, and it's eating everything. These, these three things together is the problem that we're trying to mitigate right now. It's here in the Caribbean, it's here in Trinidad Tobago, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Right? That's, not, that's not us accepting defeats, but it's the nature of invasives. It has invaded, it's an invaded the marine ecosystem. Right? There is no possible way that you can get rid of every single one of them. All we can try to do is control them. We'll touch on that in a little bit. Right? Uh, and well, I spoke about the, um, the risks, but just to go into it just a little bit more. Um, in terms of tourism, um, Caribbean islands they depend on coral reefs, for example, as a tourism product. So if you're losing your, your herbivorous fish as well as your cleaners, you're going to get unhealthy reefs. Unhealthy reefs mean less tourists, less divers. Um, so that's a loss to your economy. But in context, um, Florida, for example, spends approximately 150 million US dollars per year just dealing with the eradication of lionfish to maintain its tourism product. So the trade-off is they spend 120 million dollars per year and they still make a profit off of tourism. As opposed to if they let the problem persist, then they would be making a deficit on tourism. Right? Jamaica, same story can be told with Jamaica. At some point, we're going to be doing a similar economic assessment for us, but we are in a unique phase in the invasion where it hasn't exploded. It, it does not seem to be having a noticeable negative impact as yet, but we're in a position where we can do something beforehand. Right? So, this is actually from Jamaica. This is one of their reefs that's been on. There's a, there is a strong, clear correlation between reef health and the density of lionfish. Reef health and the density of other carnivores. Reef health and the quality of the fish that we find in the reef. Right? In terms of, um, in terms of predators, even in this native environment, there are no known real predators. You do have incidental predation, um, sharks. Sharks will feed on anything. They can survive. Um, yeah, they can consume pretty much anything. You know, the, 
the language itself, it, uh, it administers a venomous payload. This I'm going to touch that a little bit. It's fine for shock, um, eels are fine, groupers are fine. Generally, it's very large fish eating very small line fish. And how they eat it, they tend to eat it head first. So when it eats it head first, all these spines actually can leave back on the bottom. So they're not getting stuck. Right. Um, we have had some incidental instances here, and a lot of researchers have looked at whether snappers or creepers or eels can be trained how to, um, how to eat lionfish. fish. That's not how it works. That's an evolutionary process. Right? A fish isn't going to pass for free meals. So if you kill a lionfish and you dump it in front of another fish, it's a free meal. It's going to eat it, but you're not training it. Right? What you're actually doing is encouraging it to associate divers and divers who are hunting for lionfish with a free meal. Right? So um, then fish will start to get aggressive or competitive around you while you're diving or snorkeling because they're expecting a free meal. So some people have actually been bitten by eels and barracuda. Uh, because they expect them to give them a free line fish meal. Alright? Um, funny enough, just off the tangent, that's the story of Jaws. The story of Jaws is because someone was eating this shark food, and the day that he didn't have food, he actually came from the bottom and bit the diver. And that's why the picture of Jaws is that. That's just one of those stories. That's why you don't feed wildlife. Next slide. Right, so in terms of the Caribbean and Trinidad video, this is just to give you an idea of where it is in the Caribbean, so you notice it's in every, every island has it in the Caribbean, right? And every island has it worse off than we do. The wor most, yeah, the worst affected would be the Bahamas, would be well, the States, of course, would be Jamaica, alright? Um, so we got it from two fronts, it was coming down the, the, arch, the archipelago, it's also coming down the south, the central South American coastline. We're not sure which route it came from. It could have come from, um, it could have come from, I don't know, Aquarius. It could have come from the boat trade. It could have come from a bunch of routes. So we did some, well, we about to start a genetic study to try to figure out um, which population came from and was a possible mechanism of um, entry into Trinidad and Tobago. But we're not sure what's happening. In Trinidad and Tobago, the very first one was found in Tobago, as I mentioned before, and just, just to give you an idea what the spread is so far. We've had some reports in some other areas because we do have some. Um, so I'm old Pedro so there used to be reefs in some of these areas there, yeah? so they are hard parts. I mean, you can find some reef type communities there, but not coral reefs. Uh, I have not a chance to investigate those as yet, but people have reported it in both there and there. Uh, I'm not discounting that it's not there. Granted, the water may be very murky and whatnot. Chances are you're not going to get many of them there, but they could still be present. At the end of the day, it is here. Alright, the question is what we're going to do about it. Alright, next slide. So what we have been doing about it is a lot of um, a lot of community work. So since 2010, when it first got to Venezuela, to um, to Barbados and Venezuela, we've kind of been expecting it to come to Trinidad today, right? Um, so uh, since then, I've been doing a lot of environment um, education awareness. So programs like this, training people, if you encounter lionfish, what do you do? Um, there's a human health aspect to it. In the next slide, you're going to hear about the venom of the, um, of the lionfish. It's venomous, not poisonous. Um, what you do if you are stung by it, what's, what is the first aid? If you're going to try to catch it, what's the safest way to do this? So I've done a lot of these practical trainings. Um, expect more so in Tobago. I, I focus more on the divers because I'm trying to get the people who are in the water all the time um, to be the ones to remove it. Um, so uh, we do have this green fund project coming up. So for the next year, um, we've enabled pretty much most of the divers in Tobago and spearfishers to actually go out and actively remove it. Um, we have, uh, we, well, there's an ad hoc marine invasives committee which has developed a draft action plan. It's not nationally recognized as yet, but it's something that we're informally following right now. Um, and, well, I organize these routine cutting trips, so I'm in Tobago fairly often, so... Uh, you know, wherever I go, I always have like a day or two just for treating a lionfish. Um, I do prioritize areas, so what I mean, what I mean by prioritization, it is right around the island. There is no way with the resources that we have we can remove them from every reef. But say for example, Buku for example, if you wanted to control the amount that's in Buku, right, repeated and frequent culling of lionfish in an area has been shown to, well, if not totally remove them, 
uh, to reduce them to numbers where you don't even notice that they are there. So whether space like story or map free or whatnot that you want to keep lionfish free, that's what we have focus our efforts. The areas that we're not focusing our efforts, we're probably going to be lost our lionfish there. Alright? Next slide. Alright? So, but well, one of the things that has to happen, one of the challenges that we have been having is people have been misidentifying what the lionfish is. Right? So the next slide is going to show you, it's, I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail what it looks like. But these are the three fish in Trinidad so far that people have been most confusing the Latin fish with. Right? So the top left is a flying grenade because it has these very large pectoral fins. You talk to somebody, look out for this fish with large pectoral fins, these large fins. You know, uh, they, they'll forget about zebra stripes, they'll forget about spotted tail. All they remember is, you ask the man say something about a long pectoral fin. <laughs> right? And then they will call me about this. Uh, people call about this because they hear about this when looking fish that sits in the bottom. It's just a regular crappy fish. That one is the most frequent one, and that's the one that we have. To, that's a scorpion fish, right? Because people have been stung by this, and they know that you can get stung by that as well, right? So most people, oh, I've got stung by a lion fish, and then when, they, when you get more information about this, that's a scorpion fish. All three of these are indigenous to our system, all three of these do not cause a, a threat to our ecosystem. Only that one does. Slide. So in terms of what it looks like, um, I touched on this a little while ago, right? But this, this is just a graphic, just to go through it um, clearly for you. Um, well, the characteristics: pectoral fins. It's laid back on this one here. Um, Zebra-like stripes. Uh, the dorsal fin, the caudal fin, and the anal fin are the only ones that are dotted. All the others are striped, right? The venomous fangs, right, so it has venomous fangs. They're only found on the dorsal fin, so it has 13 venomous, well, I mean, 13 venomous dorsal spines, three venomous anal spines, and two venomous pelvic spines, right? Um, and the anal, and the anal fin and the pelvic fin, they are quite short, right? So you just need to be careful how you're handling it. If you're comfortable handling fish, It'll be fine because no, like if you ever held a tilapia, for example, you wouldn't just drop your hand right on top of it. There's a particular way that you would hold it, right? The same way you would hold this. That said, I never advise anyone to hold it barehanded, right? We have non-puncture gloves which we give out to people. So everything that you need to handle and fish, we actually give it to you for free. Um, there are non-puncture gloves which you can use to safely handle and fish. But once you cut the spines off, it's actually perfectly harmless. So I mentioned it has a better cable. Venom is only found in the spine itself, but actually the upper two thirds of the spine. Right? So the flesh itself is not like it's not like the um what's the Japanese fish? Puffer. Puffer. Yeah, um, puffer. It's not like that one where the where the toxin is gonna eat itself and you have to dissect it and get rid of that. In this there's nothing in the flesh. It's only within the spine. Mm -hmm. You can take a pair of scissors, a pair of pliers, and just cut those off. You can either cut them off or you cut the venom of spine off for one. But see, if you say just cut them all off. Once you cut them all off, it's just like a regular fish. It's just like a snapper. It's just like a It has a consistency of the grouper, actually. It's very sweet. Right? It has these fleshy tentacles over its eye and below its jaw. It's more of a use as a lure when it's a juvenile to attract fish. So fish come, they try to nibble on that, and then it eats the fish. As it becomes an adult, though, these might, you know, shrivel up and become little nymphs because it's becoming an active predator now. It's not that anymore. Alright, um, next slide. Alright, but if you are stung by a lionfish, right, the venom itself is protein based, proteinaceous, right, which means that it's broken down easily with heat. Alright, so apply hot water or as hot as you can take it, alright. For the general population, up for about, um, for about an hour to an hour and a half, um, but always seek medical attention, right. Um, for a general population, most people are going to have the same reaction, and that reaction is pain. Right? You're going to feel intense, throbbing pain for the first hour. It'll probably subside over the course of the next 24 hours, um, but over the course of a week, will you truly, will, 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 will the pain itself truly dissipate? Right? But it varies. It depends upon your immunology. It depends upon your health, fitness, age. It depends upon how much venom. Uh, got injected, it depends on where you got injected, it depends on a whole host of things. But the average person is just going to feel pain. Maybe some sweating, worst case scenario, you may get some uh, paralysis. Uh, but think of it like a bee sting. Some people are allergic to venom. So some people may go into anaphylactic shock. Right? So that's the worst case scenario. Alright? 
Uh, that said, no one has ever died of being stung from a lion. But there has been one death, and that's as a result of a secondary infection. You always seek professional medical assistance. Someone got stung, uh, the wound itself got infected because of blood poisoning, and they eventually die. So if you're diving, for example, and you get stung, a boy should dive to the surface, treat it with first aid, clean the wound, and then seek some medical attention. Afterwards. Some people take painkillers for pain, some people do different things. Generally, the only thing that really works is to break down the protein. Quite heat. Alright, next slide. Right. So in terms of what we've been doing, in terms of the nature of my research, uh, I'm only interested, well I'm mainly interested in the ecosystem impact of the lionfish, in terms of what it's doing on fish communities on a whole. Right? So I catch the lionfish, I look at the stomach contents, and then I relate that to what's happening in the environment. Right? So I've assessed pretty much every reef in Tobago, I know how many fish there are, I know the biomass is, I know the general range of sizes are. Right? So now I need to figure out what are the lionfish eating, and then go back to that population and see if I'm seeing any noticeable changes. Right? I haven't seen any noticeable changes as yet. Right? So what we have, the program we have going on right now is people catch lionfish in Tobago. They call me, or they call the army, I get the lionfish from them, I, do the, um, I get the basic metrics, which is the length, weight, as well as a couple other things. Uh, I look at their stomach contents, both lips, etc. And then we try, to, we try to, as best as possible, describe how our population is functioning. When there's any difference to other populations in the region, and that's, that would be a way how we can um, try to predict what might happen uh, in terms of the future of, of the invasion. Because we're still very much in the early stages of our invasion. Right? So this graph, this graph right here is just based on simply one um, fish, uh, male, female, and some unknowns. So it's, it's following up. Um, it's following up an expected curve. It's not as steep as what, you had, what we've been seeing in some of the other islands. So they're growing a lot slower here right now. Um, why? I'm not sure as yet, but nature do see what's going on. Um, next slide. In terms of what they're eating, they're eating a lot of rats. Right? That particular type of rats that they've been eating, um, they are very good cleaners. Right? They're eating a lot of cleaner fish. Right? So something that I want to look at is roots that you have, uh, but whether where you have uh, a lot of the ras predation, whether you see an increase in um, disease or external parasites on some of the fish. Right? And a lot of these are fish that we consume um, when it's not as uh, even some of the shrimp, we're not seeing some of the shrimp in some areas that you more raise the fish. Right? Um, some of the other fish, these would be like cotton fish. This area is a lobster, so they eat lobster. Um, uh, well, sure, you can see shrimp inside there as well. Um, different states of digestion, so if I can't tell what it is, it's an invertebrate or invertebrate. Alright, next slide. Alright, so what we're trying to do right now actually is, at the end of the day, the lionfish is still a predator. It's a carnivore like any other that we have in the reef, right? But there must be a, a critical threshold at which it's going to have a negative impact on the reef. So, a healthy reef can have lionfish on it, and that reef can still be healthy, right? But what number of lionfish does that reef need to have, or what density, before you start getting a negative impact on the reef, right? So, that's the type of research that I am interested in, and that's the type of research that I am looking at. So, for now, I'm just looking at their metrics, looking at their population, and then I'm going to try to, uh, try to answer that question. Because, as I said, there's no way that we can remove all of them. But if we can figure out what that threshold is, then we can try to keep them at that number so that it's not having an overall negative effect on our use and utility of the reef. So, in terms of um, resources that I highly recommend you uh, have a look at, that very first one, that's probably the Bible for lionfish. Pretty much up until 2012, all the science has been done on the lionfish, so what has been working, what has not been working, recommended strategies that you can modify 